welcome to this installment of the Frank and Mary on Nantucket show. Um, as you can see, the seat beside me is not there because our dear Arthur Bergeron is not here today. It was not a weather related delay, only we have a special guest that could come not on a day that he's here. And so I would like to introduce to you Peggy Cahill. She is on Nantucket um, helping us kick off the 2020 year of the Nantucket Senior with a workshop on age and dementia friendly communities. So Peggy will be leading us in a workshop, first of which is today, the second two follow in two weeks from today. And um, Peggy, tell us a little bit about, well, first of all, Arthur would want to know <laughs> about if you're a wash ashore. So I'm sure you are. So I'm going to change that and ask you, what brought you to this kind of work? Well, first, I want to say thank you for having me today. And it's great to be on the island. And um, it's really an honor to be invited to help the town of Nantucket become more age and dementia friendly. So thank you, Allison. You're welcome. And to the Council on Aging and anyone that was instrumental in helping me to be here. What brought me to the work um, was originally working with my own father and my siblings uh, and a set of caregivers to provide good quality of life to my father as he went through the journey of Parkinson's disease. And he was aging in place and living at home. So I saw both the challenges of what it means to age in place and also the joys and the moments of connection that were possible to create a more supportive environment for him. That led me to working with a woman um, in Beverly Farms, Massachusetts, um, who had early stage Alzheimer's disease and had lost touch with some of her most fundamental passions. She was had been a flower arranger, a calligrapher, and a gardener. And as she was dealing with early stage Alzheimer's, she was less capable of organizing herself to do some of those things. So when I met her, I felt very drawn to her. Um, she had a sort of inner radiance and it turns out that she really guided me into the field of working also with people with dementia and looking at the efficacy of the arts to really improve quality of life. She began painting and working with flowers and all kinds of creative inspirations grew out of our connection and learning what she wanted to do creatively. Mm -hmm. um, that then brought me further into the work um, where I, <clears throat> for several years, worked at Artists for Alzheimer's, which was a nonprofit organization in Woburn that was working with the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, in New York to create museum programs for people with Alzheimer's. Wow. And Artists for Alzheimer's had a museum network in the Boston area. So I worked uh, as a director of that museum network. It was a seven museum network, and we led specialized tours for people with Alzheimer's and their caregivers. And we sat in front of paintings and had slow art conversations and witnessed many miracles unfolding when people began having perceptions and stories and imagination and interpretations. And it's really taught me that we're all in this together um, and that we learn from each other and really truly grow together when we create these rich experiences. Oh, that would be great to maybe have something like that um, here and go to a whaling museum or art galleries or something to actually meet um, meet up with people outside their homes. That would be fantastic. Yeah. So you have several museums on the island? Yeah, art galleries, museums. We have one great museum, mm -hmm. um, but there are places to go. Yeah, well, they're wonderful. It's wonderful to invite people to participate in culture, and that's a lot of what Age and Dementia Friendly is, is creating these... Um, cultural experiences mm -hmm. and really the arts are a per perfect medium to, to build connection. So so let's talk a little bit about the actual workshops. Today is um, workshop number one. They'll, they'll all be different. Why don't you lead us through what, what we can expect today and what could happen the next two okay. workshops. So today is really looking at um, the foundational ideas of what it means to create a vibrant sense of community for older adults. And that means really accompanying people on the journey of aging, supporting them to remain as capable, healthy, and connected as possible, and really living with dignity and meaning. So we want to create a positive vision of aging while also looking at the challenges of aging. And then what can the, the town of Nantucket do 
to become a more supportive uh, social environment, to create the conditions for people to thrive and flourish. Um, in addition, we'll look at the World Health Organization, which began this initiative for age and dementia friendly back in 2002. And so it's a worldwide? It's a worldwide initiative um, that cities and towns throughout the world, other countries are working on this initiative. Massachusetts, the AARP, is the local, the national affiliate of the World Health Organization. And um, AARP Massachusetts is part of the AARP National, and they're working on this as well. Governor Baker um, made a commitment to reimagine aging in 2017, I believe. Um, and that means that he has committed the state of Massachusetts to be an age and dementia friendly state second to New York. So we're the second state to officially be working on age and dementia friendly community building. And so do you know how many com you know, communities are and cities are already age and dementia friendly in Massachusetts? Um, my understanding is there's something in the range of 200, 200. cities and towns in the state working on this. And so to, to be designated an age and dementia friendly community, what, what has to happen? Um, to be officially designated under AARP, there's a membership application that um, looks at what the town or the city has done to date and what the town is doing to move forward with becoming more age friendly. If there's been any leadership team developed, community leadership team or a task force committed solely to the initiative and thinking about what kinds of goals and objectives would be laid out. So the AARP process is a five-year process. It's a one to two-year planning process. There are goals, action plan goals established, then measured and monitored, if you will, and progress is evaluated, and the action plan is also an integral part of becoming AARP age-friendly. And so do you get a pin or a <laughs> sticker or what? You get no. a certificate. <laughs> You can get a certificate. Um, AARP came to the town of Wenham, which I just worked with for two years, um, helping spearhead as a consultant their age and dementia friendly initiative, which was called Wenham Connects. We named that initiative and we um, called creating it, it creating a vibrant sense of community was kind of our mission. And AARP came and officially gave the certificate of membership to the town to the town administrator and the board of selectmen and those that came to be part of that um, celebration. So they worked on it for five years? No, the, the town of Wenham has been working on this for about a year, um, but they submitted the application about a year or so ago and they were accepted with the application to enter. Oh. And now the entry engages the process of the five years all right, and so that th they would be emerging now. Are they, would they I'm be not sure. That I think they may be close to emerging or mm -hmm. emerging. Um, this year is the 2020 year of the Nantucket Senior, so mm. we're really trying to incorporate a bunch of different things into that um, and have groups working on it. Would that be something that would be considered um, an active part of our town? you know, having the people working on the 2020 year, the senior. Absolutely. Great. great. That's, that's actually an excellent entry point. Um, so it, you've identified this year as the year of the senior. That's showing the level of priority mm -hmm. and that you're placing emphasis on the needs of seniors, which is an incredible age-friendly, you know, action. And um, I think it would be perfect to include that in the membership application for the AARP to say that we've had the UMass Boston do their survey. These are our findings. And we're now dedicating the year, 2020, to the seniors. And we have groups that are working on this. Absolutely, it's perfect. Great. Um, so again, what will we be talking about today at the workshop? So after we talk about um, laying the foundation for a positive vision of aging and what that means, and looking at the World Health Organization and AARP, we will also look at some of the actual ingredients of creating an action plan. And that would be the, probably the bulk of our workshop today. That will take up a bit of time. We'll, I'll show you some examples of what an age-friendly initiative can look like in a community. And I'll also draw attention to the 2015 World Health Organization 
World Report on um, Aging and Health. That's a very vital mm. um, document that talks in great length about some of the ageist assumptions that get in the way of prioritizing the needs of seniors and improving their quality of life and also what are the key ingredients to become a more age-friendly community and develop more positive strategies to meet the needs of seniors. The second workshop, I think, could look more deeply at the dementia-friendly movement. I think that is a very important area of emphasis. And we know that there are burgeoning memory cafes throughout Massachusetts and across the country, which is a beautiful invitation for people with dementia and their caregivers to meet others in similar circumstances. We actually are just starting one in February, February 13th. That's fantastic. And so hopefully our next guest might be ta um, Taylor Hiltz, who was the activities director at the skilled nursing facility, our island home, mm -hmm. and then has since moved on to um, human services at the for the town of Nantucket. Mm -hmm. um, so she is a perfect person to facilitate that, and we look forward to getting that up and running. It's going to be at the at 56 Center Street, which is part of the community school. Mm. Um, and I will have the details on that. Oh, that's um, that sounds yeah. So that's another another step. Yeah. So we so I, that sounds timely for the second workshop to focus mm -hmm. on what a dementia friendly community can look like, um, and. I think the third workshop can be a, a solidifying of what we've talked about and really sitting with people and thinking a lot about how the survey that was done in this community can translate into action, maybe creating a vision statement for the initiative, um, talking very specifically about who would like to be part of this initiative uh, moving forward. Uh, whether that be called it be called an age-friendly task force or a community leadership team, that's a really central part of the initiative is gathering all of the town in a in a more coalesced way. So it's a social cohesion model that you want to have the, the town leaders, people that are public officials, the health department, um, the schools, maybe the faith communities that this really is, an initiative that requires um, the social community to come together. And it's also an initiative that's really often driven by the residents themselves, so the seniors. So we need seniors that are really concerned about this topic and want to, want to mobilize the community to come on board as part of that task force so that their voices are at the center. And so um, you mentioned schools. How, how are school, um, how could the school system become involved or the schools on Nantucket? Well, so I think that intergenerational bridges are very important and um, really bringing, bringing the generations together. There are communities where that's being done um, across, across the country. And what's important about that is that caring for the old is really caring for all. When Salem did their age-friendly initiative, they called it Salem for all ages because we're all aging. <clears throat> and when we teach children to care about the older population, we're also paving the way for them and for those that uh, you know, their parents and their parents so that it's, it's really something that we all share as part of the human experience. And to teach kids that and have them involved in, it really creates, weaves a nice tapestry in a community. And so age and dementia friendly community is a mouthful. So you're giving examples of other communities that have are doing the same thing, but not just but not calling it such a long and drawn out. Yeah, name. every com every community is naming the initiative based on the unique character of their of their special community. Mm -hmm. And that is something for Nantucket to reflect on as well. What is the unique character of Nantucket and how would we want to name the initiative here and to get people enthused. Right. We have a very rich history. I can think of us, you know. Our names coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, we have a lot of creative people in the community, I'm sure, that could, um, that would take the ball and run with it when it comes to that. And mm -hmm. I believe it is important to have it be our own instead of, um, you know, we are part of the world and we have, you know, we share the same aging population that that everybody does, but 
to, to call it something that means something to us, I think is great. It's also, it's also really important to have that inspiration and to really feel inspired about it is really a, a key to making this initiative work. And so when we named the Wenham Initiative, Wenham Connects, that was after brainstorming and after holding a listening session with seniors coming in and lots of ideas were exchanged. So these idea exchanges are very um, important to the initiative. And once we named Wenham Connects, we had students working on the logo design. Um, another student actually designed the survey for the town. Wow. Um, another student is now part of the community leadership team, actively working on moving that forward with, this, with the leaders of that team. So that's where that generational yeah. exchange really can become vital. Well, so we have a really, we have a growing population and our school systems, I mean, our, our school facilities have doubled. The Boys and Girls Club had just had a beautiful new renovation and they're full. So we have a lot of young people and finding a way to connect them to this um, initiative to me is is going to is going to be something I look forward to coming to fruition because mm. to to me, me, mesh the old with the new or the young with the old, I mean ageism is the only ism that that is it that affects everybody. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's something I'm particularly interested in learning more about is aging and and ageism and how people um, discriminate against people unknowingly, oftentimes mm -hmm. because they're old. Mm -hmm. I think that um, those assumptions are really in, ingrained and uh, checking our perceptions is an important part of opening up that conversation. Um, so I think one of the things we can do is talk in the second workshop or the third about more concrete examples of the generational exchanges that I've been a witness to um, and might help you in your thinking about how to bring kids and seniors together in this community. It sounds like there's a lot of young people. It's a perfect opportunity and um, wouldn't want wouldn't want to miss that. Right. And uh, I think it sounds it sounds rich. A lot of children obviously have grandparents and some grandparents may or may not have a dementia, for instance. So talking to kids even about that as well, so that it demystifies and destigmatizes those with a memory loss diagnosis and brings people together it can be a very beautiful um, knitting and weaving people together. And so I always talk a lot about ageism. I mean, if I mention mm. Ashton Applewhite to one more person um, as my new favorite book, <laughs> um, I could get booed. But um, <laughs> tell me a little bit about ageism and how that fits into, you know, because people feel, oh, I'm not discriminated against due to my age. I mean, people feel relatively comfortable about their age here, but um, there are a lot of people that don't come out because they're old or, you know, mm -hmm. other reasons. Um, tell me how ageism plays into this community building um, initiative. So ageism is steeped in stereotypes. And although people may not feel the impact of those stereotypes. Some people may not, others may. And one of the things we've learned, both in Wenham and Salem, when Salem came to talk to us about their age-friendly initiative was that the, the discovery that they made was that loneliness was the hidden epidemic. And we've discovered in Wenham that same thing, and people even announced it in the listening sessions. Oh yeah, actually, I think I am lonelier than I thought I was, but I didn't really want to acknowledge that and we said it's okay you know let's talk and openly about these topics and I do feel invisible as I'm aging another person said Marianne who then became part of the community leadership team because she was concerned about the stereotypes and the invisibility so as the conversation opens and dialogue happens people can begin to sometimes it's permission to have a conversation about this and Ageism is insidious, the ways that it operates. One of the things that the World Health Report talks about is the aging inevitability, is that as people age, there's this aging, and then there's these assumptions about it, and then there's a dismissing of people. And that is ageism, because age 
aging can be a time where if people are supported and there's access to rich experiences, then they can do better and the aging cycle looks different. So how do you see things changing intergenerationally? I mean, you know, you know the, the depression um, babies are now our, our older generation. So as the, you know, as the generations change, do you see changes in the way people view ageism? Well, I think it's becoming more of a subject of conversation. Um, I was just working with a woman last year who's in her 80s who has written a book interviewing 100 people in their 80s. <laughs> and it was really in part to share a new vision of, of old age, of aging. So re-envisioning aging and reimagining it. I do think that um, there are more examples of people living a more vibrant life. And um, I, I think that we're getting there slowly, but I, th I think that there's a lot more work to do. Yeah, and so tell, um, let's talk about the listening sessions. That's, okay. that's part of um, the workshop presentation. Um, how does that work? Listening sessions is opening up the, the conversation to the participants that come to a workshop and simply you know, asking, what do you see as the strengths in this community? And what do you see as the areas that are obstacles uh, to aging well? and to healthy aging, and what are the areas that need to be improved upon, and what are your recommendations? So it's just opening, it's a platform for listening to the voices of people who live in the community. And so what could a possible outcome of a listening session be? I think listening sessions are a perfect place to begin to record what the reflections are, and to hear the voices of people, and then put those inputs into the action planning process, um, and so and so, share the story of the of the select board, the former select board member in in Wentham. Okay, um, there's a man named Wynn who lives in has been a lifelong resident of Wenham, Massachusetts, who came to our first listening session at the town hall in Wenham, which was to welcome seniors in the community to come in to hear a bit about the Age and Dementia Friendly Initiative to learn about what that was, and then to open up the conversation in a listening session as to what's working and what isn't working so well in the town. And what are your recommendations? Wynn was an integral part of that conversation. And at the end of the workshop, he came up to me and he said, Peggy, I, I used to be a selectman, but I'm not any longer. I'm retired, but I'm very interested in this. I'm really inspired by the idea of creating a, a, a healthier community for seniors, and frankly, we don't have any place as for seniors to come together and talk about the big picture. So we just did that and we really need more of that. So Wynn is now one of the leaders of the community leadership team in Wenham, and he has a particular interest, a rapt interest in housing and affordable housing. Many Wenham seniors on the survey said, we want to age in place, we want to stay here, and we don't think we can because we can't downsize and we can't afford it anymore, and the prop taxes are exceedingly high. Yeah, that's, that's similar to what we hear, or what we heard on the survey that was done for Nantucket as well, so. And I read that too, yeah, yeah in your survey. So it, it struck a chord of similar themes throughout many cities and towns that UMass has shared with me, that this affordable housing and being able to age in place for people that have been lifelong contributing community members, we need to do better. Yes, we do. Well, we're, we definitely have a lot of things that we're talking about, mm -hmm. housing-wise across the board, but Are housing, for, yeah, housing for seniors is something that needs to be spoken about a little bit more. Right. And, that, and again, those, are, you know, those individuals may not come and speak up as much, but the survey gives you a window in mm -hmm. that those individuals are there and they're concerned about it and they don't know how they're gonna stay in the community they love. That's right, well, believe it or not, our, our half an hour is up. <laughs> I can believe it. Yes. <laughs> um, it's been a, a pleasure to talk to you and to share ideas back and forth. I'm grateful that we've had this chance. Well, and I thank you for coming over. Um, again, our next two workshops will be on the 6th of February, no, 
the 13th the, of February. The 13th of February and Thursday. the 27th of February, both Thursdays, two weeks apart. And we hope you'll come. We hope you come. Please You're call welcome. the Salt Marsh to register. Um, the number will be below on the screen here. And um, thank you so much for watching.